Hello, everybody. Um, let me just work out the technical stuff. Um, can anyone see me? If you can, please say hi in the chat. Awesome. Yay. Hello, everyone. Um, I just need to very quickly test some audio stuff. So give me one second. Uh, this is a piece that's being read tonight by Claire. Um, I'm just going to very quickly play a short preview to test the sound. A short wonder through the recent history of visibility. All right, looks like that's working. Yay. Okay. Haha. <laughs> oh, hey everyone for showing up. Oof. How's everyone feeling? Enjoying their Wednesday nights? For me, this is a Friday. <laughs> so I'm ready to get silly after this. Ah. <sighs> Just gonna wait a little bit longer, another two or three minutes. Yeah, TGIF. <laughs> you guys like my pro streamer setup? I got a ring light. <laughs> <sighs> this is my first stream as creative producer. I'm pretty excited to be here. I'm sitting in the empty Express Media office. Uh, <laughs> yeah, pro streamer mode. Um, enjoying a mild Wednesday night. I'm going to go have a beer after this. <laughs> oh, hey, Bam. <laughs> OK, um, I'm going to get started because we're running on a bit of a schedule. So here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the stream. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm broadcasting to you from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nations. Um, I also work and live on these lands. I'd like to pay respects to elders past and present, as well as to any Indigenous and First Nations people tuning in. Um, sovereignty was never ceded anywhere on this continent, and I'd like also to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country that we are on, wherever that may be. Hello, my name is Mia. Some of you may already know me. <laughs> Um, welcome to my first stream as creative producer here at Express Media. Um, we're here to celebrate the amazing work of last year's Toolkits participants. Who? What is Toolkits? I hear you asking through the digital veil. <laughs> well, let me explain. We at Express Media are very passionate about supporting young and emerging Australian writers. It's kind of our whole deal. Every year we run our toolkits program, which is a series of uh, intensive skills development courses in which we guide a cohort of emerging writers to become better at what they do. Um, it's a writing course, it's a workshop, it's a masterclass, it's a Q&A series, and it's an industry introduction all rolled into one. Uh, if it sounds like I'm flogging it, that's because I am. Uh, the first series of toolkits courses for this year is currently open for applications and we have worked really, really hard to deliver a real doozy of a program for you guys. Um, the application is in the stream description. Um, we're running courses on fiction, nonfiction, and digital storytelling, led by the incredible Annie Zhang, the incomparable Hasib Hurani, and the inimitable Rory Green. 
Um, we also have a program of Q&A streams with guest artists and industry experts, all of which are publicly streamed and available to everyone to tune in, not just to the participants. Um, we'll be announcing those guest artists tomorrow, so keep your eyes peeled. This program is open for under 30s, under 30 year olds, and applications close on Monday, the 10th of April. That's coming up. So please, if you're interested and you haven't applied yet, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Get those apps in and apply for all of them. Hurry up. Um, if you have any questions, shoot me an email at creativeproducer at expressmedia.org.au or stick around to the end. I'll save some time for a QA. Thank you. Um, tonight, we've got a really exciting lineup of readers from last year's graphic narratives and digital storytelling streams. That's right, the two new media ones. We're here to celebrate the work uh, because really for me especially, that's, uh, that's what it's all about, right? Like that's why we do this. We make the work, we get it done, and we get it out there. Um, even though I didn't produce these courses, uh, when I got my hands on these pieces and I read through them, um, I felt incredibly proud of the participants, and I think you're in for a real treat. There's some really good work here. Um, the graphic narrative stream last year was facilitated by Eloise Groves, whose experimental graphic memoir slash novel, Big Beautiful Female Theory, has just been shortlisted for the 2023 Stella Prize. So a huge congratulations to Eloise. Um, Eloise's cohort put together an awesome zine of short comics called Multiple Monstrosities, a Field Guide. It's a grimoire of monsters. It's very cool. And the uh, participants had a lot of fun with it. Um, the digital storytelling stream was led by Rory, one of Australia's leading voices in the experimental digital writing scene. Um, Rory is one of my favorite writers working in the country right now. Um, and I think someone who's really pushing the envelope of, of form. Um, Rory's cohort made uh, an easy end of their work and it's awesome. It's this eclectic mix of um, experimental work. It's a really cool mix of like, Digital forms, digital poetry, experimental fan fiction, interactive narrative games. I've dropped the link in the chat and stream description. And yeah, you should definitely check that out. But enough from me. I'm sure you're sick of hearing my sonorous voice. Hello, Rory. You missed my very flattering intro. <laughs> um, but you're just in time for the reading. So let's get to it. First up, we have got um, Claire Osborne Lee of the digital storytelling stream with a piece code Visibility and Obscurity. So take it away, Claire. A short wander through the recent history of visibility. Some things haven't always been visible. You are a plant tendril. You want to grow. An hour passes. You stretch. You reach towards the sun. More time passes. You inhale. Exhale. You can twirl slowly but effortlessly. You reach into light and air. Scientists have observed this phenomenon of activity within plant tendrils before, but Darwin was the first to record how they send it upwards and outwards. He was able to chart the particular eccentricity of their motions as they unfurled towards the sun. He placed a plant between a sheet of paper and a glass plate and marked a reference point on the paper, attaching a thin wire to a particular part of the plant, such as a leaf or bud. He made recordings at regular intervals by lining up the end of this filament with the fixed reference point and then marking its position on the glass plate. After making several marks upon the paper, these wanderings of plant limbs were made visible for the first time by connecting the dots charting their movement, incremental, like drying paint, across space. Darwin documented the lively, although slow-moving, circumutations of plants. Years later, other, faster movements would become visible to the naked eye with the advent of photography. A trotting horse is all four of its legs up off the ground, flying for just a moment. This was the bet that Edward Boybridge settled in 1872, only 50 years or so after the birth of photography. Six years later, he returned to the same ranch to capture a horse in motion, rather than a perfectly timed shot of a horse airborne. A series of wires ran from the angled wall every 21 inches to the shed where they pulled triggers connected to an electrical circuit. When the horse ran down the track, it would trip the wires, 
pull the trigger that closed the electrical circuit and release rubber springs loaded at 100 pounds of pressure to snap the shutters closed at 1,000th of a second. The next year, Moybridge began showing his images of people and animals in motion, published as a series named Animal Locomotion in a zoo praxiscope. His invention allowed the images to be seen in quick succession. Suddenly, things that had been previously obscured by the blur of rapid movement were made visible. Not only the way in which a horse trot moved its legs, but the muscles and tendons it engaged. Moybridge's innovation was a proto-gif and work of early cinema. Did you know that the very first assembly of photographs to create a motion picture was a two-second clip of a black man on a horse? In Jordan Peele's note, the visibility of the horse's movement is undercut by the invisibility of the rider upon its back. The name of the series of images is Gallop, Thoroughbred Bay Mare, Annie G. Annie G is the name of the horse. Today, the name of the rider, a black man, is still unknown. In Nope, the invisible rider is the great-great-great-grandfather of the Haywood siblings, and the implications of visibility and invisibility in Gallop, Thoroughbred Bay Mare are further amplified by politics of vision throughout the film. One article, The Power of Looking in Nope, points out that the Haywoods' quest to photograph the alien who devours those that dare to gaze up at it is not about the fame and glory of capturing the image of a UFO, but about opposing the gaze, reflecting the gaze back onto itself. It's about who has the right to look and who is being looked upon. And then, in the following century, we became obsessed with the visibility of movement, not just in cinema, but in art also. Moybridge's Woman Descending Steps, plate 137, becomes Marcel Duchamp's New Descending Steps. In just a few centuries, and then in just a few decades, our field of visibility expanded. It was only a few decades ago, in 1959, that the Explorer 6 satellite sent back the very first picture of Earth from the outside, a blurred and mostly imperceptible image of the Pacific Ocean and its cloud cover. In 1966, the Lunar Orbiter 1 took the first photo of Earth as seen from the moon, but only a portion of the Earth can be seen. The rest is blanketed in shadow. Grainy and imperfect, it is lined with noise and still very, very beautiful. And then in 1972, the first image of Earth in its entirety, a blue marble swelling with clouds. Here, the sun was perfectly positioned behind the Apollo 17 crew who snapped the image bathing the sphere in light and revealing each detail of its surface from one side. In just 13 years, Earth pulled into focus, and then, and then selfies from robot rovers, solar systems being born, ancient reservoirs on Mars, the shining expanse of the universe, raging storms on the surface of planets, and then stars twinkling in the distance. But, but this expansion of vision remains in question. Invented at the end of the 16th century, the microscope allowed us to see microbes for the first time, matter which surrounds us but can't be seen with the naked eye. And yet, and yet, the microscope is more complex than just seeing through a lens. More complicated than a magnifying glass, the microscope has to be learned to be used. You might need to slice the specimen, and you will likely need to stain it with a dye. You learn to see through a microscope by doing, not just by looking. It is an act of alteration and of manipulation, not simply an act of observation. Even the camera Moybridge used to capture the horse and trot, and Darwin's glass and paper method of recording writhing plants can be called into question. They're tools which interpret vision for us, rather than allow us that gift ourselves. And then earlier this year, NASA released a photograph they had taken of Sagittarius A, the supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy. And yet the image is not a normal photograph of what appears through the telescope. Because black holes trap everything, including light, they can only be seen negatively. Their gravitational pull is so fast and so powerful that it causes the gas and dust it's swallowing up to glow. The image of the black hole is the shadow of one, but this shadow gleams. And so an event horizon telescope was needed to capture this unique shadow. Made up of radio observatories across multiple continents, the resulting image is a kind of composite image, a black hole hybrid. 
In Andreas Dersky's photographs, individuals appear to be swallowed whole by the expanse of technology, commerce, industry, and infrastructure. The images are huge, extremely detailed, and blindingly colourful. Once, I put a Gursky up on a projector. Even with the loss of resolution and size from the real thing, I felt that the works began to engulf me too. Because photography has a limit on how large it can be without losing resolution, Gursky has constructed a method of photography that allows him to create these immense landscapes. By taking many photos from different positions, Gursky is able to digitally stitch them together, resulting in a seemingly infinite commercial irreality. And, and like the image of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, these composite images make visible the invisible. The connections that constitute globalization, computer networks, international exchanges, trade relations are less visible. So Gursky's work forms a striking image of a phenomenon that is in many ways hard to pin down. In other words, to show globalization as it really is. To make the invisible sublime, the image must be altered. And yet it is so different from seeing. These images capture a flattened landscape in contrast to the habit of the eye, which focuses on one thing while the rest remains in the periphery. Because Gursky's images are so flattened and so uniformly chaotic, there's no one point within the frame to rest the eye on. There might be individual expressions, individual gestures of people within the image, but the mass of throbbing visual excitement that surrounds them causes distraction. Instead, the eye whips around the composition, restless, overstimulated, exhausted and detached. But the inability to really see the image allows for the machinations of contemporary capital to reveal themselves. Our eye is restless and overstimulated and exhausted and detached because so are we. So, so obscurity becomes a tool for reinterpretation, for making the invisible visible. In Nope, scenes that took place at night were actually shot during the day. To capture the crystal clear expanse of darkness that extends far beyond the borders of the ranch, the cinematographer set up a rig that combined a normal camera with an infrared camera. The result is a glowy, moonlit darkness, visibility in obscurity. Darwin with his handmade marks in ink between paper and glass. Moybridge's device with its trip wires and multiple cameras. The light microscope with its series of lenses, mirrors, and dyes. The Event Horizon Telescope, a sum of countless radio observatories and wavelengths of X-ray light. Gursky and his Frankenstein photographs. From minuscule and within reach to distant and colossal, and from the slow moving to the swift, these layers of obstruction between our naked eye and the real produce a new kind of vision, one that allows us to see beyond the human dimension. All right. Wasn't that awesome? Woof. Okay. What an awesome piece. Thank you so much for that, Claire. I really, really, really love that one. I love the its, its engagement with such a wide range of different kinds of images. Um, I love the way that it interweaved so many different historical threads. Um, I loved its sort of really compelling elusiveness. Um, thank you. That was sick. Um, <laughs> thank you, August. Thank you. Um, Great. Next up, we have a piece from Tim Newport. Um, Tim didn't actually get a chance to record their piece, so they've entrusted me with the duty of reading from it. So you're going to have to hear more from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just share that. Uh, pull that up. Traveler's fanfic, this one is called. Uh, to stream. Can everyone see that? Yeah, great. Here we go. <clears throat> Time travel or quantum tunneling, or whatever timey-wimey stuff you want to call it, requires four points of data, time, elevation, latitude, longitude. His longitude is 1.4496320445. Combined with his latitude, this gives his map position accurate to 110 microns. His latitude is negative 37.8170398882. What floor of the building is he on? Ah, the 32nd floor. 1.3750231 meters above the ground. Easy not to think about it. Anyway, it's nearly time. 
T minus five minutes. He takes another sip of coffee. He reads the newspaper. Ooh, a branching path. It's still warm, but not as hot as he'd like. Still, it could be worse. T minus four minutes. He looks out the window. It's a bright, sunny day out there. He regrets not spending more of his lunch break outside. T minus three minutes. He looks at his watch. He looks at his phone. Three unread messages from his daughter. He said he'd call her today, maybe later. T minus two minutes. It's nearly time. All right, time to go. He gets up from the chair and walks to the counter. His time of death is T minus one minute. That will be 10.50, thank you. He reaches for his card. He reaches for his cash. Sorry. It feels like his brain is being probed with an arc welder. He collapses to the ground, groaning in pain. Everything goes. Open your new eyes. You look around, your hands dropping to your sides. You're breathing hard. Unfamiliar shapes surround you, and the smell of fuel and burning steel has disappeared. Examine your new body. You fight, you fight through the panic, trying to remember your training. There's an order you should do this in. Okay, start with the head. You reach up to touch your face. You notice that the new length of your arms give you a new arc of motion, and you have to adjust so your fingers make contact with your cheeks. Two hands attached to two arms, that's already an improvement. You appear to have a much longer body than you're used to. Your skin feels rougher, but it's so clean. What is this over your eyes? Plastic of some sort. All right, corrective lenses. Everything is so crisp. And someone is saying something to you? Hello. A woman is walking around the counter, which you realize you've fallen down in front of. You see she's wearing a black short sleeve shirt and her hair, so clean, is tied back. Hey, are you okay? Do you need me to call someone? She bends down you a level and you prop yourself up on your two big arms to face her. Up close, the smell of coffee and perfume is almost overwhelming. I'm fine, I'm fine. No, that's okay, I'll be all right. You scramble to get to your feet. You scramble to get your feet under you and stand up. Your body feels weirdly solid, like you're wearing a weighted vest. It's nothing, saying thank you. Okay, she says, take as long as you need. I should go. You walk out of the cafe and into the bright atrium. You feel your clothing, some sort of a jacket, a suit maybe, and notice there's some items in your pockets. Take out the wallet, take out the phone. As you open the wallet and begin to flip through the detritus of your life, you reflect on how easy the transfer was. In the end, months of study and weeks of physical training all seem in this moment to have been wasted. All you had to do was lie down, and suddenly you were here. Read ID card. Before the transfer, when you started researching your host, you remember wondering if anyone would notice the difference. After all, you would look the same, sound the same, and their life was incredibly simple to memorize. What could go wrong? But now, as you see your new face staring up at you from this little plastic card, you start to worry. Put the wallet away. Okay, enough hanging around. You have a mission to complete and a team to make contact with. You start to get the balance of your new body, trusting your host's muscle memory to guide them into the elevator. And you're pleasantly surprised to watch your new hand press the ground floor button instinctually. There's a brief moment of weightlessness as the elevator descends. Remember protocol one, the mission comes first. The future is relying on you. It's time to save the world. Thank you for playing. <laughs> Made by T Newport as part of Express Media's Digital Storytelling Toolkit 2022. Watch Travelers. Oh, okay. What's Travelers? Oh, it's a show. <laughs> oh, that was terrific. Um, thank you so much for that, Tim. I, I love that piece. I uh, loved reading it. A lot of fun. Um, yeah, what a win. What an epic, epic win.
Next on our lineup, we have a piece by Adalia Nash Hussein. Um, this is from the graphic narrative stream. I'm just going to share that screen. Hi, I'm Adalia, and I'm reading the comic that I made for the Monster Zine. And the comic I made is about a monster called the Cute Little Guys. Uh, this is them and their alias is that they are also known as schnookums. Their height is, as you might imagine, pretty little. Their scent is, of course, Joe Malone's Nectar and Blossom and Honey. Their habitat, uh, well, they hoard and nest amongst the cute and adorable. They're often found in trinket shelves and toy boxes in groups of between 10 and 100. That's what their footprint looks like. And the things they like include Sanrio, kittens, Hayao Miyazaki's Ponyo, stickers, and tomatillos. They dislike big dogs, dust, minimalism, and gore wasps. Their enemies are, of course, Funko Pops. And they're very common, so they only have a half star rarity rating. Well, they subsist off proximity to cuteness and can draw power from it that can be used to time travel and grant wishes. And this is the comic. I love cute and tiny guys. Guys with big eyes and soft bodies. Guys with long ears and itty bitty toes. Guys that are not guys at all, but pleasing household objects. Pale pink antidepressants. Bookmarks of precise and particular dimensions around the size of a business card, but squatter. I like to hold them in my hands, press them into my belly and arrange them on my shelf. Discerning, a connoisseur of cute. I do not like squishmallows or Funko Pops. Blank, uniform expressions, copying the features of cute without capturing its essence. I will not be fooled or distracted from my own cute little guys. My favorite cute little guy, why, it's the girl reading this, of course. Um, thanks so much uh, to Eloise and Express and all of the other people in the Toolkits comic stream. It was so fun getting to make comics together and I loved all of your comics. Bye. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Adalia. I love Adalia's cute little guys, and I love their little cameo from um, Pinky and Pepper at the end. Um, terrific. Okay. Our next piece is um, a piece by Ryan Pactaganon um, from the Digital Storytelling Stream. This one's a really good one as well. Um, I'm excited for it. Uh, it's called Maranong. Um, let me just load it up. Here we go. Hello, I'll be reading my piece for that I did during Toolkit's digital storytelling. It's called Maruno. We are always under construction, tiptoeing across time, trying to understand the forever coming to pass. Spindly fingers pickpocketing memories, sipping beer at seven in the morning, mirroring the uncles and aunties who have collected, collected these four. Ages of time reduced to a tepid rush, gusts of wind hollering into an abyss, slipping through these quiet shuffles during dusk, weaving through pillars with red plastic bags full of ingredients cutting through calamansi and onions, a dash of kikuman slathered on pork thighs, served with a cradled phone connected to black earphones, soft kisses through and on the screen, 
with family more than a few hours away. Listen in Tagalog. Magulo ang maga daliri. Magaalala ang mandrukot humikop ang serbesa sa alas 7 ang umaga. Sumasalamin na maga tiyuin at tiya na nang kolekta ang maga ito para sa ang maga paglipas ang panahon ay nagin mainit na pagmamadali. Magabukso ang hangin na sumisigaw sa isang kalaliman na tumadaustos dito. Tahimik na shuffles kapag napit hapon. Naghahabi sa maga haligi na may maga pulang plastic bag na puna puno ng maga sangkap. Hinihiwa ang kalamansi at maga sibuyas. Isang duktong ng kikuman na nilalamon sa maga hita ng baboy na inahain kasama ng isang duyan na telepono na konektado sa itim na earphone. Malalambing na halik sa screen at sa screen. Kasama ang pamilya mahigit ilang oras ang layo. Try either spindly or fingers, all lowercase. Remember to click submit. Hello, you. Ah, uh, try again. It's okay to make mistakes. This is just a coin flip. No big deal. Marunong ako konte Tagalog. Means I know a bit of Tagalog. The language that was spoken to me when I was little. It was quickly overtaken by English and Mandarin as the years went by. I never got around to learning it. Forgive me for how bad it must have sounded just now when reciting the poem. My name in Mandarin. This game does not support the characters. Don't worry, it isn't anything too complicated. Just a direct translation. Who was that narrator? Plunging you into this game with a foreign language and self-inserting too much. Is he the same person that was reciting that poem in mediocre Tagalog just now? No matter, first you take a path of this dark and we shall begin this fun game. Just get to the cat to reach the next level. I suspect these other items are to throw you off with more banal backstory. I've not had sinigang since I moved back to Melbourne. A sour soup with a pork and tamarind base. Sinigang is one of the comfort foods back home. I couldn't make it, but it won't be the same. My mom said there was a famous Filipino restaurant up in St. Albans. I'm a bit too lazy for that. Did you really read more of that backstory? It barely adds anything to the game. Seriously, tell you what, ignore the rest, get to the cat. Have another drag while you are still here. Hmm. You have chosen to bite the apple. It's ripe. Yes, this was supposed to be an apple. Have you checked out the bottom right of the page? There's something cool there too, really. Yes, that bottom right corner with no icon. Sometimes things are hidden like that. Um, for context, I haven't played this game in months, so yeah, I, I don't remember everything. Here is my attempt at writing my name in Chinese characters with pixels. This one is Lai, to come, to be at, to arrive. This one is Un, 
favor, kindness, lie on, to come with kindness, to arrive with favor. As you can tell, these meanings have nothing to do with my name. Just a direct translation. This is in my original mother tongue. Right. How did you even find this? Right. Excellent. You are now stuck in this secret room with no way of escape. You are now subject to lines of poetry scattered around the room, constructed however you want or not. You could restart the game and get back to the main room with the cat. Fissures of a time lost. Tilted heads amidst the sea of red. Two year long doldrum with endless forest in sight. Soft scratches on disparate molds. Needing away knots of the one you love. Tepid words from a fan that has not been cleaned for months. Straightening an underbite with a popsicle stick. Aha, you found the rogue star. Star that does not carry any poetry. The star that twinkles despite not having poetry. The star that, I don't know, probably heightens how pretentious this page is. I told you not to get sidetracked and get to the cat. Who is this narrator anyway? There is no way out of this box if you were trying. Fine, I lied. Just go on the towel that you came in on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I wonder if you checked everything that needs to be checked. A bit disappointing that the cat didn't even speak, huh? No purr, no meow. Just a symbol of a portal into this next space. There is no turning back from here. No kidding. Um, it seems to be a worm of some kind. You don't know why it's squirming in this one spot. Stuck in the snow, maybe. It continues to wriggle in the snow. You just keep looking at it, I guess. Good on you. That probably is enough to post up photos of the worm. Move along now. During winter, most worms stay in their burrows, prisoners below soil, frozen hard as rock and topped by ice and snow. Hmm. Why is this worm still here? This living creature seems to be a worm of some kind. You don't know why it's squirming in this one spot, stuck in the snow, maybe. You are probably smoking a bit too much at this point. Mm -hmm. Do you remember in this quote what the first four words in Tagalog meant? Mm -hmm. That's four in the span mm -hmm. of a few minutes. Well, I can't blame you. Having a puff in the window mm -hmm. does feel amazing. Don't smoke if you haven't started. The exit this time is in the top left. I've kind of lost the plot of the game. Tamana, Bahalaka, Sabuhaimo. Then you go into the flats below, yeah. These public fat flats remind you of home, a place where you can hear Tukalo again. A convenient place of osmosis. Mahal kita. I love you. Bahalaka, Sabuhaimo. Take care of your life. Tamana, that's enough. Marulong ako konti Tagalog. I know a bit of Tagalog. This one was often said to the roulette wheel of guests throughout the years. Number five, 
trying to learn one's mother tongue is tough, huh? especially in realizing that all these years you were ashamed of being Filipino. Mm. You would detest hanging out with other Filipinos. Mm. The children of your parents' new friends here in Singapore, they were happy to find people of similar cultural backgrounds. Why weren't you? You must be confused. I am too constantly. Sipping beer at seven in the morning. Ages of time reduced to. A cradled phone connected to black earphones. I broke down around two months ago on a phone call with my partner. I told her that I missed my family and that maybe I should have tried harder to do the little things, like learn Tagalog. I can't wait to go home to have some pork steak. Pork thighs with a mixture of calamansi soy sauce and onions. A friend told me in class that St. Albans was not too far away. Maybe I should make the trip soon. The treasure those you hold dear. Cherish the sights, sounds, smells, etc. I wonder where that snarky second narrator went to. I wonder if we all have this little snarky narrator within us. Tamana. Mahala ka sa buhay mo. Mahal kita. Next time, I will try to do better than Marunong Pako Conte Tagalog. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you, Ryan, for that really, really beautiful and moving piece. Um, I love it. <laughs> I think that is one of my favorite pieces, I think, ever, sort of dealing with um, the topic of language. Um, it really, really makes you realize that it's a, it really is all about delivery and not content. <laughs> Even if you've listened to a thousand diaspora poems about you know, the sort of nostalgic and painful relationship with one's mother tongue. Um, and even if you've written your fair share yourself, um, I think, yeah, seeing that, seeing the cool things that Ryan does with form, um, the crispness of Ryan's writing really, really, I think, highlighted for me just how um, how important form is in, in sort of the delivery of, a, of an experience. Um, I adore that one. Um, thank you so much. Uh, awesome. Next up, we have, yeah, very well made. Next up, we have Selena Mora Wilson reading a short comic um, from the Monster Zine. It's called Kelpie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Selena. Um, I'm one of the participants from Toolkit's Graphic Narratives, and I'm going to read my monster comic from the monster comic book that we made. So my monster is a Kelpie, and not just any type of Kelpie, it's a communist type of Kelpie. Um, their habitat includes salt and freshwater lakes, and they're originally from Scotland. Their height is three to four meters, which is just way too tall. I was trying to think of them being like a bit bigger than a normal horse, but then at like three to four meters is just so much taller than a normal horse. But Oh well, it's three to four meters. Um, abilities include breathing underwater, emotional intelligence, and nuanced thinking. Uh, they like braiding their hair, gardening, sleepovers with friends. Dislikes include wealth inequality, centrists, the nuclear family, and their enemies are billionaires, which we'll see more of in a minute. Um, and their rarity is four stars because why not? I could just kind of change that number. Um, yep. And their footprint is a horseshoe. Crazy. So interview with a Kelpie. So we open and we've got a shot of the lake. This is the Kelpie's lake. 
and we've got some trees, swamp vibes. Perhaps it's nighttime, perhaps it's daytime. There's no way of telling from what I've drawn there. Um, but yeah, so we've got a billionaire in the background and he's going, help. And then the Kelpie's screaming in the water going, die. And the Kelpie emerges from the lake, sort of elegantly prancing about, has a graceful little shake, shakes all that water off. And then goes, oh my God, hi, I didn't see you there. One sec, sorry. Blood spurting out of its mouth and then turns to the side, goes, it's my spit noise, spits out a hand, a human hand. And then, okay, let's do this. Strikes a cute little pose, love that. So welcome. So that's my lake back there. Billionaires, yep, I drown them. Yeah, there's an exclusive wellness retreat in the area. So they come to me, makes my job easier. My process, sure. So I start by singing a song so irresistibly beautiful that the victim can't help but follow my voice. Next, I invite them on my back. Billionaires are obsessed with dominating nature, so they always accept. And now it gets fun. My hide is super sticky, so, and that's to trap an enemies. So once they're on, they're stuck. And the last part is just running into the lake and drowning them. Um, I get pretty passionate at this stage. Um, and then we've got a little billionaire guy screaming, ah, and then the Kelpie goes crazy marriage and says, you have inflicted unspeakable horrors on this planet and its inhabitants. You are a thief of dignity and joy, and now you will pay. Traditionally, Kelpies targeted children with this method. So this was back in Scotland, and I'm doing my part to try and change that culture. Attention Kelpies, public forum on why drowning kids is bad. Uh, I suppose I have mixed feelings about revenge. I kill these guys, but capital keeps raging on. Am I being too individualistic? But it's also like, I'm not not gonna kill Jeff Bezos if he's in the area, you know? I don't know, it's complicated. Yeah, I'm trying to unwind more lately. I'm super into gardening at the moment. Uh, my work is pretty intense, so it's nice to have a space to be gentle. Anyway, I better go. My BFF Hog and I are hanging out tonight. He's a poet. We're gonna make algae friendship bracelets and catch up on forest gossip. I cannot believe Jesse did that. I know it's cooked. Well, thanks for stopping by and don't forget your souvenir. It's Elon Musk's tea. Cool. Um, awesome, thank you for listening to my reading. Um, and thank you so much to Eloise and Express Media and um, everyone else in the graphic narrative stream. It was so much fun making comics with everyone. Um, learned so much and just, yeah, really grateful that Express puts these programs on. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the launch. Bye. <laughs> I love that one. I love those little horse drawings. <laughs> oh, they're so good. Uh, thank you for that, Selena. Um, we've just got one more piece for the night um, from Natalie Williams. So this is the one that's closing it off. I've sort of tried to arrange the um, the pieces that we got back in a rough set list. You can see that we've had sort of an eclectic mix of tones and lengths, you know, um, by nature of the different forms that people are playing with. You know, some that are a bit funnier, some that are a bit more somber, and, and you know, um, all of them consider consider it um but uh yeah i was sort of patting them out in different ways um trying to slot them so that you know this uh presentation had a little a little journey to it um natalie's one i think is a really good one to close this off on and so i am just going to set that up and let that play um thank you to express media for allowing me to read my work with you all tonight um, I want to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which this piece was written and where I'm streaming from tonight. I pay my respects to the people of the Kulin Nation and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded and as always was, always will be, Aboriginal land. 
Um, hi everyone, I'm Natalie Williams, pronouns they, she, and I was super grateful to be part of Toolkits last year in the digital storytelling stream. Um, the piece I wrote for our class was not a finalised digital piece, but more of a diary reflection on the whole Toolkits experience. Um, it's called Art Happens Here, and it was inspired by some interesting conversations we had in one of our last classes, and also by a fantastic meme created by Tim. Um, this is the piece, and I hope you enjoy it. In the beginning, there was a tweet. Then an overview of the course. What followed was a few DMs shared, some nerves grown and calmed, and then there it was. Week one of Toolkits. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't shit scared. I'd never created digital work in the way I thought these people had. I knew nothing about coding, very little about digital lit and no clue about the tools at my disposal to create. I was overwhelmed. I was awed. I was confused, but I was also curious. Within our first Canopio board brainstorm, I saw others writing words I resonated with. Imposter syndrome, lack of knowledge, fear, uncertainty. Can I create something in time? Before starting, I wondered if I would fit in. I was worried I would find myself a stranger to the world of digital creations. But within my cohort, I found a group of creatives who were just as anxious as I was, but who had nonetheless all been chosen. Scared or not, we were all here set on a path of discovering the world of digital storytelling. I set a goal for our 12 weeks together, not to have a finished piece, but to allow myself to expand my view of creating, to break down my walls of perfectionism and to revel in the fields of making freely. I'd spent the last year locked into the chains of inadequacy, they would pull me this way and that, away from making anything that my inner critic would deem not good enough. Within weeks of participating in toolkits with the Digi Storytellers, I was coming up with ideas that I'd never thought of before. I was imagining ways to utilise the tools I was discovering. My bookmarks folder grew substantially, with a wealth of URLs to check out later and pieces to come back to whenever I had a spare hour. Through talks with the mentors and my fellow classmates, I absorbed great wisdom not only about the craft of making, but about ways of being. Our teacher Rory shared the great line, did we make this hell ourselves? Teaching me the beautiful dichotomy that if we're capable of making something one way, we can also unmake it another way. We can make, break and recreate whenever we choose, however we choose. In between sessions, my classmate Claire would join me in the curiosity and fun of the unknown, rooting each other on with a smile or a giggle. Another classmate, Tim, would offer warm, earnest advice when I was struggling in understanding the complexity of coding. They'd offer both patience and puns, including a fabulous meme inspired by one of the group conversations in our mentor sessions. The art happens here. One of our mentors, Ginny Maxwell, shared insights into how to live life as a critic and storyteller and that you don't have to convince someone that a piece of art is good. You just have to make them think, oh, that's interesting. They shared the importance of having a hobby or practice that is just for you and isn't turned into physical labor or a full-time job. Perhaps most importantly, Ginny taught me that just because something is stressful, it does not mean it's important. <laughs> it's easy to get distracted or have your time redirected by stress. Your purpose is to live, so go live. I spent so much of my creative life worried that I was writing or making the wrong way. Ultimately, I was spending portions of my life drowning in this sea of worry. These 12 weeks have taught me that there is no right way. You're allowed to make weird, baffling shit. <laughs> You're allowed to make things that don't look good. They can be abstract and out there. You can create simply for the fun of creating. The digital world is a huge playground and there's so much to discover. So tear up the rule book pull apart that instruction manual and forget all that you've been told art should be. It already is, so just let it be. Maybe then you'll learn that you can be both imperfect and brilliant too. Thank you. So go live. Woof, okay. Art happens here. What a dynamite title. I think we can all agree that art has well and truly happened here tonight. Um, thank you so much for that reflection, Natalie. Um, that was awesome. Um, I thought it was a really good piece to round off this evening. Um, thank you so much, all of the Toolkits participants from last year. Congratulations on an excellent course and 
<laughs> and uh, and you should really be proud of all your outcomes. Um, I think they're all spectacular. You've done a very, very, very impressive job. Um, and thank you so much to everybody who's tuned in. Um, so for anyone who's tuned in that missed the beginning of the stream, um, tonight we had a series of readings from participants of last year's Toolkits courses. So for those who don't know, Toolkits is um, a series of um, craft-oriented workshops, writing workshops that we run here at Express Media. Um, we're currently open for applications for this year's first stream, um, first season. So we've got streams on fiction, nonfiction, and digital storytelling. The application link is in the description. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? There's going to be a delay, so I'm going to sit in silence while people uh, what's required for an application? Um, so it's just a series of questionnaires, and we're going to ask for a sample of your writing. Um, so if you open up the link description, um, go into the submission links, it'll just sort of have a have a series of fields. Yeah. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, art wins. Yeah, I also feel like going off and making art. I've been on a hiatus from making art since December. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah been busy with looking for a job and then settling into this new job. Um, congratulations, everyone. Yes, thank you, Selena. Um, that was so awesome. Um, any other questions? Um, <sighs> is it? Uh, okay, Rory said, my tip for applying in digital storytelling, name drop digital pieces you like and why you like them. Definitely talk about things that you like. Um, I think if I had a tip, it would be be honest about your work, be honest about what kind of work you want to make. Um, don't worry too much about what we might be looking for or writing into a certain kind of literary mode. Um, that typically results in, in a more tepid kind of application. Um, because you know, sincerity is 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 uh, sorry. Insincerity is typically quite obvious. Um, we're looking for passion. We're looking for people who really, really care about the work that they make and have an idea, or not necessarily a clear idea, but want to make some kind of work and and, and feel passionately about some kind of creative work. Um, Sincerity asks: Is the digital storytelling aimed at teaching the basics, or is it also suitable for people at a bit more familiar with the format? Um, I would assume both. Um, I think that, uh, I guess it depends on how Rory plans to run it, but I, from my understanding of last year's, um, if you're coming in with established sort of technical knowledge on how those forms work, um, you will still be getting a lot out of it because it's also talking a lot about writing as a form. Um, and yeah, the craft that goes into creating compelling digital narratives. Yes, Natalie said, I would say some knowledge would be useful. Yes, very good. Um, yeah, having some knowledge of any form that you're working in is always a good starting point. Um, but, you know, um, I think toolkits generally, we don't really consider them sort of beginner courses, which isn't to say you need to have like an established sort of technical knowledge about how to work in digital forms, um, how to work with Twine and stuff in order to actually apply. Um, just that, you know, where, where you know, not courses, yeah, they're not necessarily courses for people who've never written before or have no desire to write and just sort of want like a pastime, you know, this is definitely a course for people who care about writing, want to be better writers. Um, that's what it's for. Ah, okay, any other questions? I'm going to wait another minute or so. I'm just going to talk about myself for a little bit. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I hope that that was an all right stream. <laughs> thank you, fellow worms, says Claire. Um, yes, we are all worms of the earth, my friends. Um, I, I bought a ring light just for this. I said this at the beginning, you might have missed it, but you can see in my glasses reflection. Isn't this cool? And look, you can change different light settings. Look at this. Ha! 
Ah, <laughs> uh, neat. <laughs> How do we get as cool as you, Mia? Asks Natalie. Um, that's a good question. You guys have practice, is my answer. <laughs> Um, yeah, quarter past seven on a Wednesday night. <laughs> yeah, I'll send the $12 on tax. Yeah, I definitely will. Um, all of my no tax that I'm paying this year, <laughs> this financial year. <laughs> yes, thank you, Magenta. Magenta said Mayor is very charming. That's why you hired me. <laughs> Um, yeah, and thank you to everyone for being so patient as we work through those technical issues. Sorry again to <laughs> I'm sorry again to Claire um, that the audio quality in your piece wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, I, I hope that it was still very good. I'm sure that it was. Everybody seemed, seemed to love it. Um, and that included me. Um, so, yeah. All right, I'm gonna wrap up the stream now. If nobody has any other questions, never be sorry. Okay, I'm not sorry. I don't apologize for anything. I don't owe anyone anything. Um, I'm gonna wrap up the stream now. So thank you so much for tuning in everybody. Um, congratulations again to everybody for your incredible work. Um, please apply for toolkits, open until Monday, although it might be extending if you want some more time for um, to work on your applications. And you can apply for more than one stream as well. Um, don't forget that. Apply for all of them if you want. We will put you in one of them. <laughs> um, so, yes, thank you. Great. Um, oh, hey, Torsten. Um, okay, cool. Goodbye. Ciao. <laughs>